Um, thank you very kindly for the invite today and um, thank you for Phila Korea for arranging this. So today I'm going to talk to you about Endopredict, which is a gene expression analysis kit or um, test, which is an in vitro diagnostic test, and it's called one of the second generation gene expression analysis. So for today's presentation, I'm going to cover a little bit about the clinical dilemma. Um, and this relates to intermediate ER positive HER2 negative breast cancer patients. I want to go over the report and the report really has three pieces of quite vital information in it. A little bit about the design, the structure and the validation of the actual test covering things in terms of no negative, no positive, looking at different subtypes, looking at premenopausal versus postmenopausal, a little bit about chemotherapy benefit as well. I then want to compare it to clinical standard features, compare how it works to guidelines and compare it to other tests that are on the market because there's, there's a few gene expression assays around. Look at its utility in the actual clinic and where it's being utilised for de-escalation. And then I'll summarise what we've discussed um, for this evening. So, as I said, I think I'll, I'll start with the clinical dilemma. So, we're talking really here about intermediate ER positive HER2 negative patients. And what we know with these group of patients is they all receive endocrine therapy, but it's the decision of whether to give chemotherapy or not give chemotherapy. Um, when they're defined as a definite low risk, so a small tumour, no negative, postmenopausal, we're fairly confident in saying they're low risk and you don't need a gene expression assay to confirm that. And counterwise, if they're high risk, greater than um, four nodes positive, um, a large size tumour, we're fairly confident giving chemotherapy. Where the challenge is, is when we have these indicators that are mixed and what it does is it creates a group of uncertainty on how to handle these intermediate women. So these genomic breast tests, they more accurately identify patients that are low risk. So that is that they won't have, um, they can be considered for foregoing chemotherapy. Um, so this is a little bit about the history of prognosis when we talk about um, these intermediate groups. So we really started off with looking at clinical factors. So typical things like tumor size, grade, K67 status. Um, then we progress to using like multivariant prognostic models. Um, some of these are still on the market. Um, some have moved on. So things like Adjuvant Online, this has now moved on to predict. Um, there's also another nomogram called CTS5. So these are just like free web-based styles um, prognostic models. Then in 2002 was the introduction of Mammoprint, so one of the first generation gene expression tests, um, followed by Oncotype DX. So they're, they're quite popular, been in the market for a long time. We call these first generation tests because they just look at the um, gene expression or the biological um, gene expression within the tumour. Then following in 2011 was um, the second generation test. So these combine both the molecular signature along with clinical parameters, okay? Now, what the great thing about this is throughout the history of um, this prognosis in early breast cancer, it has evolved and we're getting incremental prognostic power increasing continually over time. So they're getting better and better at being a prognostic predictor. Um, so I wanna just run through quickly what a report looks like. Um, sorry, uh, someone is requesting to annotate the shared content. I will just approve this. Right, okay, I'm not quite sure what that is. Um, 
Okay, so now I'm going to quickly run through what the report looks like um, and what you see on a report if, if you were to have an endopredict test. Uh, I'm terribly sorry, my computer has frozen. Sorry, I'm going to have to close that and move forward. Right. Okay, let's keep going. So this is the over, this is the first page of the report, and really it's just a summary and it's an overview of um, everything. So the first quadrant at the top is a little bit about the patient identifiers. Um, we have our molecular signature and our molecular score, as well as tumor stage and nodal status. We combine this in a unique algorithm, and this gives it gives us what's called an EP clinical score, and this will determine whether you are low risk or high risk, and you get a binary answer to whether um, you can forego chemotherapy. Now, also on the front page is a little bit about treatment planning. So the first um, quadrant is about the initial treatment planning, and this is basically your 10-year likelihood of distance recurrence if treated on endocrine therapy alone. And this is if we were to add chemotherapy, what your absolute benefit would be. Um, we also have what's called long-term treatment planning. So this really is looking at whether you could avoid extended endocrine treatment. So there are three parts to the report and each one is individualized with basically a risk curve associated to them. So if we further drill into it, um, the second page will consist of your 10-year individualized risk estimate if treated on chemotherapy alone. So it is a binary answer. You're either low risk or high risk. Um, this is the risk curve. The black bar is the cutoff at the 10% um, risk, which is the acceptable risk between detrimental side effects of chemotherapy. The second page is a bit about your individualized absolute chemotherapy benefit. So if you were to add chemotherapy, you would be um you would have an absolute chemotherapy benefit of an additional 0.3%. And the very last page is a little bit about whether we can safely avoid extended endocrine therapy. So what this is about is each patient would is their individual um, risk of reoccurrence if staying on five years of endocrine therapy. So they're the three components to the endopredict test. Um, I now really want to talk a bit about how we designed the test and a little bit more about the validations of the test as well. So when we look at how we designed it, um, we used a homogeneous cohort of ER positive HER2 negative patients. There were no HER2 positive patients in the cohort at all. Um, we started off with what we call a top down approach. So we started off with um, every gene that was available at the time. We did this on fresh specimens on microarray analysis and we did it unsupervised. So we had no biases towards the biological motifs or anything. Then we narrowed this down and down until we came to 104 genes. We then transferred this to a gene expression assay so that it could handle um, FFPE samples because these are from the tumor samples. And we came down to um, eight genes of interest which showed high prognostic power, okay? Um, we then, from the training cohort, which was about 964 samples, we then further validated this in five additional trials. Um, you will see some of our trials. These are all prospective retrospective trials. So they were retrospective in the sense we didn't know the answer. Um, prospective and we knew the 10 year outcome. Majority of these trials, all women were treated with endocrine therapy alone, except for the GECOM study. Um, they were mixtures of node negative and node positive. But the main thing is if they were low risk, the 10 year 
distance metastasis rate for the low risk always fell between three to 5.8%. So well within the range that is acceptable. And it was consistent between all our studies and all our trials. And um, there's actually well over 3,000, 3,600 women to date that have been validated for endopredict. So it's quite a large cohort. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about um, the implications of clinical parameters. So I spoke a little bit about at the start that the first generation tests didn't include clinical parameters. Now, what this is, is we looked at um, the Austrian Breast Cancer Family Study. There was 1,702 women in this study, all treated with endocrine therapy. And what we did was we just looked at the molecular signature, okay? Um, and once again, the black bar represents our cutoff point and the red um, curve here, which is your probability of distance recurrence, the bar hits at 10%. Um, and what you'll see is the gray bars represent the 1,702 women. And with the molecular signature on its own, you can see the curve is not really that steep. Um, what we did was we included nodal status and we included tumor size. So this gives you a little bit more information than just the biology of the tumor. It's telling us how long it's been in the body and for how much time. And we found that by doing this, we got a much steeper curve, okay? And we pushed more women into the low risk group and we had stronger prognostic power. So this is a little bit about the difference between a first generation test and a second generation test. The hybrid score is much more prognostically powerful. Um, so I've pretty much spoken about the design of it. Now I want to further look into the validation of it. And I want to look at it and subdivide it and look at the performance in node negative as well as node positive. Look at it in different subtypes, so invasive lobular and ductal breast carcinomas, um, and look at it in pre and postmenopausal women. And the premenopausal data is relatively quite new and exciting, so um, I'll go into a bit of detail about that. And also talk about the prediction for early and late metastasis, as well as the prediction for chemotherapy benefit. So this is a little bit of overall data actually, and it really summarizes the consistency between the test within the different validation cohorts. Um, and what it shows you is that those that were low risk had excellent outcomes, okay? So you can see they're well below the 10% threshold. Um, chances of distance um, recurrence is low. It, it ranges from about 4%. And what you can see is, and this is all women treated on endocrine therapy. And what you can see is that it pushes lots of women into the low risk category that, that can forego chemotherapy and be safe and do well. So 55% um, up to 65, um, up to 65%. Let's now break this data to node negative and node positive. So what you're seeing here is um, the node negative results. And once again, very similar results. You're seeing a distance recurrence um, in the low risk group of about 5% in both cohorts. And once again, pushing a lot more women into the low risk group. This is up close to 73 to 78%, okay? Um, we then further subdivided this into um, no positive disease, which is generally considered higher risk. Um, and what this shows is it shows even in higher risk node positives, um, there is still a proportion of women that are low risk that will do well on endocrine therapy alone. And you can see over the 10 years, once again, 5%. So, so very similar results, and it's pushing somewhere between 20 to 30% proportion will have this very low risk of relapse if treated on endocrine therapy alone. Now let's look at subtypes. So um, we had a mixed, this is one particular study looking at invasive lobular cancer. Um, a lot of these gene expression tests are 
commonly used on invasive ductal carcinoma. Um, what we have here is the little dotted lines basically are the ductal carcinoma and the full lines are the lobular carcinoma. Um, what you can see is the low risk and the high risk separate really nicely. Um, but when comparing the two groups, of lobular and ductal carcinoma invasive, they're pretty much the same. So, so there's really no variation between the subtype of invasive lobular cancer. Um, even first, further subdividing this, we're now looking into node negative, node positive within the invasive lobular cancer. Once again, low risk is performing equally well in this subset. Um, this is the new data that has just come out. Um, this was presented this year at ASCO, and this is about premenopausal women. Um, so this was a study of 385 um, women who had all been treated on endocrine therapy with 10 years outcome. Okay, so once again, it is a prospective retrospective study. And what you can see here is the low risk group, which is in the green, are performing exceptionally well with a 3% distance recur um, recurrence rate. So the low risk had a significantly lower risk of distance recurrence compared to the high risk. So you can see the two are separating well, and pretty much it's identifying that premenopausal women in this low risk group do not need chemotherapy. Um, I want to highlight here that, that this is consistent with all our postmenopausal women as well. So there is no variation in our cutoff um, to pre to post. And I state that because if you're an Oncotype DX user, there is variation between the two um, subtypes or cohorts. Um, further looking at this data, we subdivided this again into node negative and node positive cohorts. And once again, you can see that the low risk group are equally doing well, even in the node positive. Okay, so um, EP clin or endopredict clinical is strongly associated with a 10 year distance recurrence free survival, regardless of what the nodal status is. Um, we also compared it in a multivariant analysis. So how did it compare to tumor grade? How did it compare to key 67 or ER expression? The important thing to note is that endopredict was the only significant factor associated with distance recurrence for 10 years in this premenopausal group. So strong um, and highest prognostic power compared to all other multivariant analyses. Um, this is a study that is a prospective um, study, so like prospective, prospective. To date, we only have four years outcome, so not the complete 10 years, but it's heading in the right direction. Um, it's a relatively small study. There are 99 women here treated all on endocrine therapy alone. Um, to date, after four years, there has been no distance reoccurrence in the low risk group, okay, um, which is pretty impressive. And there were about 15% of premenopausal women treated on endocrine therapy alone that sit as sitting in the EPCLIN low group. Um, so as I said, it's only four years to date, but this is a real life perspective proof of the prognostic power of endopredict in premenopausal women. So that's two um, new studies that have just come out this year. Um, so we have a retrospective prospective study based on that large cohort showing the same cutoff, showing the same consistency. And now we have the four year prospective outcome of premenopausal women. Um, so I've discussed the difference between subtypes, node negative, node positive, premenopausal, postmenopausal. I now want to really focus on long-term prognosis and in particular why it's very important in ER positive tumours. So unlike HER2 positive or triple negative tumours, 
the risk of reoccurrence continues even after five years. Um, what we have here is um, the yellow line here is node negative, then we've got node positive one to three in blue, and then we have in red node um, four to nine, okay? But basically the risk of reoccurrence is strongly correlated to what the um, nodal status is. But I think what's most important is if you look from zero to five years, the risk of reoccurrence is equal from five to 10 years. So what this is really showing you is that um, it's really important to understand long-term prognosis in these ER positive tumors. Um, we have, oh, sorry, I will just go back. We have further looked at this and subdivided our data. So in the Austrian breast cancer study group, um, and as I said, there was 1,702 women in this cohort, we were able to look at 15 years of follow-up. Um, fairly impressive. And once again, all the low-risk women um, did equally well. So we were able to look at the recurrence from basically 10 years to five years. Um, then what we did with the data is we took out all those that had reoccurrence. So this group of data is just um, the women who were, um, only the women who had no distance reoccurrence after five years of endocrine therapy. And we were able to follow them from the five to 15 years to see um, a rate of 4.3%. So, um, so this just shows long-term follow-up um, and as I said, it's evaluated from five to 15 years to, and it really helps to further assist with those women who can forego um, long-term endocrine therapy. It can also be used to show women that if they're compliant with their endocrine therapy, um, what their likelihood risk would be as well. Um, so I've spoken, oops, let me go back. Um, I have spoken a little bit about the long-term um, prognosis and how it's important in ER positive tumors. Um, I now wanna talk about how we calculated absolute chemotherapy benefit. Um, we did this using a multivariant analysis or a um, multi-centric style of analysis, where we looked at 3,700 breast cancer patients. What you will see is the blue line is women treated with endocrine therapy only and their 10-year risk of distance recurrence. And that green line is those that were treated with the additional chemotherapy, okay? And we were able to um, calculate an absolute benefit um, that you would gain if you added chemotherapy to the endocrine therapy cohort, okay? Um, please be aware that these are all current um, chemotherapy regimes. So this is, this is all relatively current data. Um, and you will see even the um, standard deviations, they don't overlap. So it's very, very tight data in how we determine chemotherapy benefit. Okay. Oh, sorry. Um, so I've spoken about the design, the validations in all the different subtypes, node negative, node positive, premenopausal. I now want to compare the test. Um, and I want to compare the test to using standard, standard clinical features, um, nomograms, multimodal sort of nonograms that are out there. I'm going to compare it a little bit to guidelines. So, um, and also to other gene tests that are on the market. There's commercially available lots of tests that are out there. Am I going for time? Okay, so um, first of all, I'm just gonna compare it to standard clinical features. So what we're looking at here is the C index. So we're measuring prognostic power. How good is this test at predicting the outcome that we see in women if they're treated on endocrine therapy alone? And initially we looked at just nodal status on its own. We added tumor size. We added in a couple more clinical features. We added in our molecular, molecular signature. But after mixing the data back and forth, we found that the highest prognostic value, which was um, up to 75%, was 
endopredict clinical. So this is adding our molecular score with the nodal status and um, tumor size. Um, how does the data compare to tumor grade um, and, and tumor grade in general, which is usually quite a common feature to support treatment. Um, and this sort of shows you that if we use endopredict, we're really adding additional information to further classify different tumor grades. So what you can see is even in um, grade one, so low risk tumors, we're still finding a proportion, 22% that are high risk that would benefit with chemotherapy. And then if we take the counter side where we're seeing high grade tumors, like grade three tumors, we're still finding a nearly 20% could be low risk and forego chemotherapy. Um, we've compared this to key 67 as well, um, or luminal A, luminal B. Um, and once again, in luminal A, you would expect them to be all relatively low risk, but we're finding a proportion, 30%, that are actually high risk that, that could benefit from chemotherapy. Um, with luminal B, once again, you would expect these to be relatively high risk. Um, and we're finding a bundle that are low risk that did equally well if on endocrine therapy alone. Um, this is comparing endopredict to adjuvant online, which at the time was one of the nanograms that is easily available um, that's free online. I think this is now being superseded to predict. Um, but what I really wanna focus on is when we were discordant with adjuvant online. So the green and the red is when adjuvant online said one thing and then endopredict said the opposite. So it, you can see the green said adjuvant online said they were a high risk based on clinical features. Um, when we looked at the molecular features, they said they were low. Um, and then you've got the counteract with the red. Um, what's and i want to want you to focus on the red and the green because what it's really saying is that that the patient outcome actually followed the prediction of endopredict rather than the prediction of adjuvant online and we've shown that the prognostic power of endopredict is um, prognostically more significant than adjuvant online so this is quite interesting data because we have the outcome data and we have the outcome of the 1,702 women in this cohort who were treated on endocrine therapy. How do we compare to guidelines? So once again, we took this Austrian breast cancer cohort, so a large cohort over 1,700 women, and we just put their clinical features into the NCCN guidelines. We put their clinical features into the German S3 guidelines, St. Garland's. Um, and what you'll see, NCCN is a relatively conservative guideline. It only pushed 6% of women into the low risk group. Um, in the German cohort, oh, sorry, the German guideline, it pushed 15% of women into the low risk all doing equally as well. St. Garland's pushed a little bit more, 19% of women into the low risk, equally doing well. But what's really interesting is this same group of women were tested with endopredict and the EP clean score pushed almost 10 times more women from the NCC and guidelines into the low risk equally doing well on endocrine therapy alone. So, so as I said at the start, using these gene um, assays push more women into the low risk that can forego chemotherapy. Now I want to compare to some of the commercial kits that are available that are on the market. Um, this, oh sorry, I've jumped ahead. Um, so there are four commercial kits here. Um, we're comparing ProSigna, which is the second generation, which is an ROR score. We're comparing BCI and we're comparing um, Oncotype DX, which is the RS score. Um, once again, we've looked at C-index. This is independent of any cutoff. So, so we know that some categories have an intermediate. It's, reg it's regardless of that cutoff. Um, 
And what you can see is Ender Predict had the strongest prognostic power compared to all other commercial kits that were on the market. This was a head-to-head -head study. This is the trans ACAT cohort. So we looked at 774 samples um, tested with all the tests and we had outcome data and they were all treated on endocrine therapy alone. Um, so we looked at zero to 10 years and then we looked at five to 10 years because as I said it's very important in ER positive tumours to understand um, long-term prognosis and and Ender predict using this C index as the standard statistical analysis um, showed the greatest prognostic power compared to all. Um, once again, we can subdivide um, it and what you will see is when we just look at the node negative patients, Enderpredict is pushing the largest amount of women into um, low risk that will do equally well just on endocrine therapy alone. Um, when we talk about node positive, um, only ProSigna and Endopredict were able to be under the 10% threshold. So if you look at Oncotype DX after 10 years, um, the women in low risk cohort were at 19.4%. So this is well um, above the acceptable 10% threshold. So ProSigna and Endopredict were the only tests that were able to do this for the node positive cohort. Um, this is further another head-to-head -head study. It's a, it's a larger subset of what I've just described that, that only looked at Oncotype DX. And what we did was we actually just compared the whole overall result, which is the EPCLIN result combining the clinical features. But we also looked just at our molecular signature alone because um, Oncotype DX is a molecular signature only. Um, so we looked at 0 to 10 years. And as you can see, the prognostic power in our molecular signature is stronger and even nearly four times fold stronger when you're looking at it with the clinical data combined. Okay. Um, we further break this down into the early years, zero to five, and then we looked at the late metastasis, five to 10 years. And as you can see, we're always outperforming um, in terms of prognostic power. And as I said, this is, when we look at prognostic power, this is a chi-squared likelihood method. Um, it's independent of any cutoff. So I am aware that the Oncotype DX cutoff has changed over time after Taylor X, but this is independent of that um, overall. So it's the prognostic power of the test as a whole. Okay, um, now I want to speak a little bit about MindAct, and, and this is to do with Mamaprint. And we haven't, I haven't got data. We do have some head to head data with the Austrian breast cancer family study, which was done some time ago. Um, but in terms of Mamaprint being compared to all the other ones, I don't have a huge, massive cohort of data like I just presented with that TransATAC data. And there's there's a reason for that. Um, when you look at the Mamaprint mind decked data after five years, um, if you remember the cohort, basically what they did was though they were compared to adjuvant online at the time and those that were discordant, so when you had like a clinically low genomic score from Mamaprint with a high um, risk score from adjuvant online, if they were discordant, they were randomised in the trial. Um, and what happened was those that were discordant are the ones sitting in the centre here, right? And whether it be high clinical, low genomic or low clinical, high genomic, it, 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 either way, what the conclusion was after five years of data, and Mamaprint is for five years, um, the conclusion was there was no additional information that Mamaprint gave beyond adjuvant and line. So it didn't really add incremental prognostic value. Um, after this data came out for Mind Act, it was quite interesting because NICE, so the, the UK guidelines, they pretty much said for this intermediate cohort that we're looking at, Mamaprint is less clinically effective um, than, and it's not 
cost effective than just a current practice or a nanogram, which you can see in the data here. So um, it's not funded by the NHS system. It's the only test on the market that's not funded. And in actual fact, after the MindAct results came out, um, even the Dutch um, no longer fund it, and it is a Dutch test. So um, their reimbursement schedule has removed it because it doesn't show incremental prognostic power. Um, oh, sorry. Now there's new data that's just come out, and this came out in 2021 on MindAct, and it's the eight year data. So it's the long term follow up. Um, and this is quite interesting, actually. So this is the overall data of those that were randomised. So we're looking at really the low risk, genomically low risk group. So we would expect them to be under the 10% threshold. Um, they're not, it's actually 89.4%. Um, this doesn't fulfil the criteria of 10 year distance metastasis free survival should be um, greater than 90% and we still have two years to go. So you can predict that this is probably gonna hit at about 86%. Um, what's even further interesting about the data is they did look at subsets of node negative and node positive at eight years. Um, and these were the groups that were following the genomic treatment strategy. So node negative would be endocrine therapy alone, node positive would be the addition of chemotherapy. Um, and once again, you can see in the, um, you can pretty much see in, where the low risk groups are going as well. So um, it's interesting, genomically low risk following genomic um, treatment really is, is not acceptable for the 10% regardless of nodal status as well. So it's quite um, interesting data to follow up with. Sorry. Um, now, my, with the MindAct data, they were also able to look at premenopausal and what you can see in the premenopausal group or under 50 year olds is they're looking at 88.6% um, here um, in the premenopausal at eight years. So once again, this is a little unclear how you should really be treating premenopausal that have been tested by Mammaprint. Um, the genomic low risk is not below that acceptable DMFS of 10%. So um, I just want to remind you of the new data that I just presented for premenopausal. So with Endopredict, we had 64.7% of women being pushed into that low risk group and they had only um, a 10 year DMS of 3% regardless of um, nodal status and premenopausal status, oh, based on premenopausal status. So um, this is really the last section and how am I going on time? Not too bad. Um, this is a little bit about the utility and where it's used in the clinic. Um, and whether it's actually changing treatment decisions and changing treatment paradigms. So let's talk a little bit about the impact on therapy decisions. So these are a couple clinical decision impact studies. So they're not really measuring what I would say the science of the test. They're really measuring does a clinician change their mind after using a test. So, so usually we say, what would your decision be before doing the test? Now you know what the decision, now you know what the outcome is of the genetic test, has your decision changed? And what you can see is pretty much there is a change of treatment that's always um, somewhere between 17 up to 43%, depending on basically probably depending on the local country's guidelines. Um, and what you can also see is typically they're all a de-escalation in chemotherapy. So it's less chemotherapy being used overall. So these are multiple clinical utility decision impact studies. Um, are we in guidelines? Yes, and a predict is in ESMO, ASCO, St. Garland's. It's also identified in NCCN and NICE and the AGCC guidelines. So really, in summary, um, I've told you a little bit about the new second generation um, gene expression tests. 
I think the main thing to really understand is they were trained and validated and proven in the relevant cohorts. So we're talking about ER positive, HER2 negative, node negative, node positive pre and post menopausal populations. Um, as I said, there's now been five validation studies, so there's lots of data. Um, we do compare tumor gene expression with key clinical pathological prognostic features. As I said, this has been shown to show the highest prognostic power, a tighter um, risk curve as well. Um, we have had consistent results between all our four clinical, it's actually five clinical studies now, um, which shows level one evidence. As I said, it's a binary classification you're either low risk or you're high risk. Um, you can either forego chemotherapy and know that the low risk will do equally well on endocrine therapy alone. Um, I've shown you a lot about the accurate risk assessment, both in early, so we're talking zero to five years, including late distance recurrence up to 15 years, as well as in premenopausal cohort. Um, and Endopredict has the ability to predict chemotherapy benefit, um, in women with a high EP clin score as well. So that's really the summary of where we're at with Endopredict. So I'm happy to take any questions. Um, I'd also like to thank Phila Korea for setting this up today. Um, and Phila Korea are, are our partners in um, South Korea and the test is accessible through them. So, and I'm happy to take any questions? Feel free to write them in the chat if it's yeah, easier. Ah, <laughs> uh, there is a question. Ah, uh, okay. Um, no. Sorry. So, can you? Yeah, I can see the question. So the question is: Is Taylorex or mine DACT, and is there DCIS data in? Endopredict. Um, no, there's not DCIS data in Endopredict. Oncotype DX has a DCIS. Um, component to it. Endopredict is only for invasive carcinomas, not in situ carcinomas. So we don't have validated data on DCIS sub cohort. So um, as I said, I believe Oncotype DX has this available, but it's actually not in any guideline that I'm aware of to date. Andrea, then I have a question for you. Sure. Uh, how should endopredict be used in the contact, context of multiple primary breast cancer in the same or both breast cancer? Yeah, um, interesting question. In an ideal world, <laughs> you would suggest two tests, but this the reality is this is not affordable to do. So what we suggest is that you take the highest clinical features of that particular tumour. So, so if you have two primaries, you will take the one with the highest clinical risk features and we would test that. If this is high risk, the question's pretty easy. You give your patient chemotherapy. If it's low risk, then then there may be the question of would you do the other tumor that is there? Um, but we always recommend start with the highest pathological histological clinical features. Okay, thank you. Andrea, there is no question. 
thank you so much for your presentation. No problem. Lovely to catch up with you all again, and um, I hope to be back in South Korea soon. I think all the quarantine has lifted, so I hopefully I can visit soon. Okay, I hope so. Excellent. Thanks <laughs> once again for arranging this. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you.